So a common practice when deploying new applications to the cloud is to place load balancers in front of them. And the way this looks architecturally is that you have a number of services of the same type. Let's call this service A. And you would put a load balancer directly in front of it. And you might have a number of, of services here, so A, B, C, D, et cetera, but let's just visualize one. And there are four main reasons why people tend to put load balancers in front of their services. One is service discovery itself. So when you need to find how to talk to A, instead of knowing all the IP addresses of each one, you only need to know the address of the load balancer, which you could keep relatively static. Makes that easy. Number two is fault tolerance or failure tolerance. And so if one of, one of these goes bad and actually dies for whatever reason or becomes unavailable, the traffic to the load balancer helps because it'll send it to a healthy one rather than an unhealthy one. Again, this makes it easier than talking directly to these. Number three is actually balancing load. And, and so with a load balancer, you could be confident that that thing is going to make sure that it goes to this one first, and then this one, and then this one, and then you know around a circle or some sort of load balancing scheme. And so this helps when you have a lot of traffic coming in. You don't need to worry as much about the load on any individual service. And then the last reason that you want to use this is some level of security or access control. So I'll just write access control. A load, ba a load balancer gives you a central point to enforce some sort of access control, usually traditional sort of IP-based access control. So you're saying over here, you have 10.0.0.1 you know, can access 10.0.0.2, and these are maybe on some other IPs over here. But this access control is here, so that you could lock it down and say who could access what. This is a traditional reason to do this. But in a cloud environment or with a, in an environment with a number of services where maybe instead of having four ABCD, you have 400 or 40, uh, this starts to get prohibitively expensive and complicated in a number of ways. And so one of the ways that this gets difficult is you could imagine that if you have a number of services all over the place, for each group of services, you need to have a load balancer. And so you go from needing maybe four load balancers to needing 40. Uh, it, and from a hardware and software perspective, this could get very, very financially expensive. Another complicated issue is coordinating the updates to these load balancers. So as you deploy new services behind it, if you add a new you know, service A, somehow this load balancer needs to be configured to know about its IP so it could route traffic here. And again, when you have four, services or some single digit number of services, that's not too hard to do. But as the number of services grows, and also as they come up and come down more frequently, like they do in sort of modern cloud environments, this becomes, from a process perspective, very, very expensive. And then the last sort of complication is the security aspect. The security in this case is very often still IP-based. And IPs work well in traditional uh, sort of on-prem four wall environments because you carefully control all the IPs and you're not moving servers around very often. But in a modern scheduled world where the, the actual IP of a machine, let's say this is you know, 0.40, might represent a number of different applications, it's hard to actually enforce this access control unless you end up splitting those applications across multiple servers, in which case you're not making the most out of your data center. You're, you're, you know, your cost is times three when you could have fit them all onto one but you have no way to represent the security from an IP level here. And so this becomes very, very expensive, again, both from a cost, security, just understanding, because anytime you deploy a new service, one, it needs its own machine, and two, you need to update the rules in this, in this load balancer so that that access is allowed. And this updating of rules could take a very, very long time. Ideally, you could do it you know, automatically. And that's exactly sort of the world that uh, we're shifting to in a modern cloud environment. So with a tool like Console, you could solve all four of these issues by eliminating sort of the east-west load balancers altogether. So in a world with Console, what you have instead is you still have your services A here, just like before, and you have your client accessing them here. Uh, let's just call that C for the client. And when it wants to make a request, what it does instead is ask Console for the addresses for A, 
and it responds with you know, all three addresses here. And it does that via DNS. And so what it would ask for here instead is actually a.service.console. And after it does that DNS request, it gets all three. And so we lean on DNS as the method for service discovery. And so that solves problem number one that we talked about before. So discovery is now DNS. The second reason you use load balancers for is fault tolerance. So if we look at fault tolerance, the way console handles this is by having health checks on all of these services and the machines they run on. And so it's constantly checking whether these are healthy here. And if at any moment it becomes unhealthy for any reason whatsoever, CPU load is too high, the actual network becomes unavailable, anything, uh, within microseconds, it eliminates that from the responses for service discovery. And so we could, we could gain fault tolerance with health checks and expose those health checks in the results from the discovery process. And this all happens pretty much instantly. The third reason load balancers are used is actually balancing load. And for balancing load, again, we could re rely on sort of properties of DNS here. And what console actually does is when it returns the, the addresses, it'll randomize them. So sometimes it's 312, sometimes it's 321, sometimes it's 123. Uh, but every time you ask console for uh, a server, it, ra uh, it randomizes these results because usually clients will pick the first one. And so this way you're getting a different one uh, between different results. And if it's down for whatever reason, the client will automatically use the second one. And so that's a way we could do load balancing. And what we find in practice, even with thousands of services, is this behaves very, very well in terms of balancing load. And the last reason is access control. And for access control, there are multiple options. Uh, in one way, you could still use IP-based uh, security if you wanted to. Console has a way to notify uh, any sort of client whenever the service has changed. So if you add a service here and register it with console, then console could immediately notify any sort of software that this happened. And so you could actually still use that notification mechanism to update you know, IP tables or on-server firewalls to do IP-based protections. And it's very, very easy to automate and very scalable. And so you could still do IP-based. And then as another option, there's a feature in console called Connect, which allows you to do service-to-service -service, uh, authorization. So then you could actually represent rules like C can talk to A, or C you know, cannot talk to A. And you represent them at this high level. So it doesn't matter what number of servers you're introducing. Here you could have four, you could have 400, you could have any number of clients, but it's always one rule. And so this makes it really, really easy and powerful to scale because console will make sure that any sort of access is represented by these rules. And so you have both IP-based and you have service-based security. And so you could see how using console and using DNS can solve all the same challenges that load balancers were used for. But when you do it this way, you eliminate at least one piece of hardware and software for every single cluster of services. And again, in a more traditional sort of uh, previous uh, generation environment, you might only have four or five, six services. And so it's not that much being replaced. But in a modern microservice cloud-oriented world, you, you probably have an order of magnitude or more services. And so the costs and the complexity begin adding up. Uh, in addition to just wanting to move to a more scheduler, dynamic environment, uh, this really works because you'll have services and servers coming in and out sort of at a multiple times, a minute or hour scale, and so you could coordinate the changes necessary to ensure all of these properties still. And so in this way, uh, you could eliminate the need for east-west load balancers.